All right, all right. Here we are again. Thanks for tuning in. Colin, what did Joey Ramon say? Hey, hell, let's go. <laughs> all right. Well, we're sure glad that you're with us today on Legends and Losers. We have a, a fantastic show today. Colin, tell our legendary friends who's on the show. Well, today's discussion is about venture capital. And with us is one of the most legendary VCs in the world, whose name is Mike Maples Jr. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that I've known Mike for, well, actually, I'm not glad to say how long I've known him. <laughs> not that I'm not glad that I've known him that long, but I'm not glad that I've, it's hard to You don't admit, want to date yourself? Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Everybody, everybody thinks I'm 26 or whatever. Um, but Mike and I have known each other for uh, longer than clearly than I want to admit. And um, he and I did a deal together when he was, uh, he was the head of marketing and co-founder of a, uh, a couple companies in uh, in the Austin area, and I met him when he had started and was the head of marketing for a company called Motive back in my Mercury days. And we actually did um, a deal together and some cross marketing and you know some deconfibrillation and and all that kind of stuff. And then um, then after after Motive got sold and all that, Mike moved to Silicon Valley, and he ultimately ended up starting his own uh, venture fund with uh, with his partner Ann Miraku and. Um, Floodgate. You know, the floodgate. And, and the thing that's really cool about what they, well, there's lots of things that are really cool about what they've done, but one of them is uh, Mike's a, a, a full on category designer. You know, he had this vision from the beginning to create this new space in venture capital. He called it a super angel. Yeah. So you think of, uh, why don't you explain to folks, uh, Colin, what an what a angel investor is as distinct from a venture capitalist. Well, an angel investor comes in earlier in the game and provides capital from the beginning of the inception of the company, generally much earlier than the venture capitalist comes in. Um, an angel will help provide seed stage money, uh, angel stage money to, um, to help get the company off the ground and, and, uh, and find the uh, product market fit. And then once that's established, that's usually when the VC comes in. Yeah, and what Mike and Ann identified was that they they saw a hole in the market, you know, missing in the market between uh, the angels who sort of fund the seed round, and if you will, the big the big the big guys uh, on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley who who do the big if you will Series A and and then continue uh, on past that. He saw a hole there, and so he created this new category. He he called at the time uh, Super Angel. What year is this? I believe it was uh, it was more than a decade ago, but not much more than a decade ago. <laughs> I don't know. You're asking me, I fucking well, you don't know how many you don't know how many scotches I've had since then. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if this is right around the time of uh, of Angelist's inception. When when did Angelist start? Uh, it's, um, it's probably around ten years ago. Is my thought? Yeah, yeah, I think I think Floodgate's ten, maybe twelve years old, something like that. Um, uh, I think he tells us during the interview, but um, it's 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 right around there, and uh, you know they've just had a phenomenal uh, phenomenal track record. Um, now there's a lot going on right now uh, in venture capital. Um, about a year ago, at this time, people were starting to talk about the coming winter in venture capital that um, it was going to be hard for VCs to raise money, and which meant uh, which would mean it would be even harder for entrepreneurs to raise money. And so there's some interesting data um, that's come out in, uh, you know, very recently here that's been reported on TechCrunch by some research from um, Mark, is it Schuster? Is that how you say his name, Colin? Schuster? Schuster. 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 I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, we're fucking destroying your last name, but it's not personal. We think your research is awesome. He's the managing partner of an outfit called Upfront Ventures in Southern California. And um, here, here's what he's pointing to. He says that um, uh, twice as many VCs cut their investments in 2016 compared to 2015. Uh, and 76% of all the VCs surveyed said that 2016 had lower valuations than 2015. That is to say, the companies that they invested in, they invested in at lower uh, prices or lower values uh, than before. And I found this one interesting. 63% of venture firms cut costs. Interesting. 
And then the other thing I think that's kind of interesting is um, VCs raised, uh, venture capitalists in, in the tech world last year raised uh, $40 billion. So, uh, well, things certainly got, have gotten a little bit rocky in VC, and there was definitely a, a pullback and a drop down of valuations. I don't think there's any, any question about that. Um, um, it wasn't as bad, you know, if you think back about a year ago, I think a lot of people thought it was going to be terrible. Um, the other, there's a couple other interesting things he says in some of this research, which is um, 20, 2016 hit a historic low for first time funds. That is to say new venture funds yeah. with only 42 compared to 94 in 2015. So just like there's been a big takedown in the number of um, startups in our country in America, um, uh, there's a takedown in number of new VC funds. I thought that was kind of an interesting um, tidbit. Well, yeah, I mean, especially the the sixty three percent have cut costs. It's uh, it's a, it's a signal. Um, and my spider senses tell me what's going on is. Um, uh, really category king economics. You know, that the top tier venture capitalists can raise money and are gonna continue to do well and the middle and lower tier are probably having a very, very hard time. Um, there's the other interesting note in, in uh, Mark's research as reported on TechCrunch that I thought was um, interesting because it, it, it could very well affect um, venture capital. And uh, that is that ac according uh, to Mark, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Cisco, and Oracle combined have approximately half, uh, uh, excuse me, 500 billion, 500 billion U.S. dollars in cash outside of the United States. And uh, President Trump has talked about um, uh, giving companies, American companies, a quote unquote tax holiday where they'd be able to bring that money back without any taxes. Is this like spring break? Yeah, or no, I actually, I, <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> yeah, or, or it might be like a weekend in Vegas. Or or weekend at Bernie's? <laughs> oh, fuck, yeah, a lot of people could get killed, if, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, back in, back in the days uh, when, when I was at Mercury, um, uh, the Bush administration did the same thing. And we had offshore money, profits from foreign subsidiaries that were sitting there and we didn't bring them back to the U S for this exact reason. And, uh, they gave a tax holiday, a, a, a uh, everybody gets to go down and do summer break in Cabo <laughs> with your offshore money. Um, and so we'll see, but with 500 billion offshore with the big boys, uh, if that 500 billion came back and turned into R and D spend, sure. uh, all those big firms do their own venture investing as well. And of course, uh, uh, you know, $500 billion in cash laying around could have a material impact on M&A transactions. So that's kind of an interesting um, side note. And um, the other thing is, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, we had an amazing discussion with Mike, and I, I've been thinking a lot about um, some of the things that he said. And in particular, um, I'd, ask, I'd ask folks listening to pay attention to the part of the discussion with Mike where he talks about what he thinks is going to be a material change in, in the economy. And this idea is a big, big idea. And, um, you know, we, we, we discuss it with Mike, so I won't let the cat out of the bag, but essentially if you really unpack what he says, he believes that the entire context that our economy is based on uh, because of technology is no longer the case. And so the whole premise of how our economy works is going to change if you believe, uh, if you believe what Mike says. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to let too much more out of the, out of the bag. Uh, it's, it's a great talk. Uh, should we uh, introduce him now? Yeah. Why don't we give Mike a proper introduction? Great. So Mike Maples Jr. has been on the Forbes Midas list since 2010 and is currently listed as one of the top 20 technology VCs in the world. He was also named one of eight rising stars by Fortune magazine. He's an entrepreneur, former CMO, and the category designer of a new category in venture capital called Super Angels. 
Before becoming a full-time investor, Mike was involved as a founder and operating executive at back-to-back -back startup IPOs, including Tivoli Systems, acquired by IBM, and Motive, acquired by Alcatel Lucent. Some of Mike's investments include Twitter, Twitch TV, Weebly, Chegg, Bizarre Voice, Spiceworks, Okta, Dig, and Demand Force. He has an education from Stanford, he has a BS from Stanford and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Other than that, he's highly undereducated. <laughs> <laughs> now here's our discussion with our dear friend, Mike. All right, all right, Mike Maples Jr., yeah, awesome. welcome to Legends and Losers. Thanks so much. I'm, I, I can cover at least one of those for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, we all know which one that I'm is. An expert. I'm an expert at one of those topics. Yeah, well, you're, given that you're ranked as one of the top 20 venture capitalists in the world, we have a feeling we know which one it is, legend or loser. <laughs> we'll see. We'll, I'll let you know in a few more years. So, Mike, we, we got to ask you off the top, why don't you tell us something legendary? Okay, for me, that one's easy. It's the moon landing. So, uh, for a few reasons, and I'll, I'll give the short version unless you want me to go longer, but, uh, you know, there's a study that came out in the early 70s uh, after the moon landing happened, and people wondered, like, how did that even happen? So you had teams in NASA that are 100 times more productive than what would be expected. And they're like, how did that happen? And they had this one example that I love where uh, they had to put an antenna on top of a mountain. And there are no roads to the bottom of the mountain. So there's people on the team. What are we going to do? How are we going to figure this out? And somebody said, we better tell our boss because we're going to be behind schedule and we need some help. And somebody else on the team says, oh, gosh, if we talk to our bosses, nothing will ever get done. I'll just be red tape. So somebody on the team says, hey, I got an idea. Who has the biggest helicopter in the entire world? And they, they're like, I don't know. I wonder who has the biggest helicopter in the whole world. It turns out it's the U.S. Navy. So NASA calls up the U.S. Navy and uh, they say, hey, U.S. Navy, um, we're NASA. Can, can we borrow your big helicopters? Um, because we got to put this antenna on top of the mountain. And the Navy says, screw you, NASA. You know, there are helicopters. You know, you go, you go do your rocket stuff. We go do our Navy stuff. And uh, NASA says, all right, here's the deal. JFK said that we're going to land on the moon this decade. And if we don't get this antenna on top of this mountain, we're already past deadline. We're not going to land on the moon in 1969, like JFK said we would. So the Navy says, how many do you need? So Navy loans them all these helicopters. They put the antenna parts in the helicopters. They fly them up to the top of the mountain. They assemble the antenna on top of the mountain. And the NASA moon landing was like a thousand examples of that. Um, and they had a term for it that I've always liked called hot teams. Yeah. And, um, you know, hot teams have a few characteristics. Um, the first thing they have is mission clarity. So the goal has to be super important. And it has to be more important than whether you got promoted or whether you just did your job or whether you get recognized for doing your job. Nobody on that team was saying, oh, well, it's not my fault if we don't get the antenna on top. You know, who, you know, who could blame me for that? They're like, no, like failure is not an option. Um, well, and the, the other thing that I love was the, the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal that um, uh, uh, um, fucking a, um, JFK said. Yeah. To, to your point, he was so precise because he said, our objective is to put a man on the moon in 10 years. And, and this is the part. Yeah, that was the part right. that was the really important part. If you're the dude, could, could, what, what was that, that last bit, Mike? And return him safe. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, and, to earth. <laughs> to earth, yes. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and so, you know, but the second part of that is, that's important is you can make it happen, right? And in fact, it won't happen unless you make it happen. It's not going to happen because of some process. It's not going to be, ha it's not going to happen because of some system. It's going to happen because you do whatever it takes to make the mission come true. And if you don't do whatever it takes, like you're letting the team down, you're letting each other down, not just the mission. Um, the other thing that we've learned from that and why I use it a lot is it, it, you can use that thinking in startups. So like most startups think they have a hot team. You know, if you went to a startup, they'd say, oh yeah, we got all these killer engineers and awesome people. And, and don't but, you hear a lot of VCs saying, hey, I, I, I back the jockey, not the horse. Right, right. So, but like what I learned from my dad when he used to run products at Microsoft, you know, we used to study hot teams and try to understand, well, could they be used 
that like could 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 you use hot team thinking to have Excel beat Lotus one two three and Word beat Word Perfect and uh, Fox beat Ashton Tate and all which ended up being true. Uh, but but um, what what the way my dad internalized it and taught to me was um, you it's it's a thought process around empowerment. So for example, he would go to a team. He'd say, okay, this is Microsoft and Carta Encyclopedia. It's a consumer product. It has to ship by Christmas. But if you told the team it has to ship by Christmas, the team completely got to decide what's in the release. Uh, and, and conversely, you might say, well, we're going to ship Windows NT, and it has to be a preemptive, multi-threaded, multitasking operating system, or it just won't be credible against Unix. Well, then you let the team decide the date. But, and, and why is that important? Projects like this are impossible. And they have unforeseen problems that, that nobody's ever going to know about. And what, what you want to have happen when there's a problem is, in most companies, what happens is the team says, oh, there goes management again, being unrealistic, giving us crazy. They're going to wreck our weekend again, those bastards. Yeah, you know, they have no idea what it takes to ship this. And, you know, and they spend time screwing around, arguing about how unfair their job is. Whereas, like, in the case where you empower the teams to be hot teams, they say, hey, wait a minute, guys, you know, the management was very clear. We have to ship this product by Christmas. And yeah, this is an unforeseen obstacle, but it's not management's fault. And it's like, we're fully empowered to figure out how to address this obstacle. But like, we're just wasting time if we talk about how unfair life is, because we're in charge of what's in this thing. And so what, what a lot of entrepreneurs mess up today is they they wrongly internalize the messages of Steve Jobs. You know, they they think of Steve Jobs as like this omniscient guy who knew everything about what the product should be and could just come down from the mountain with tablets with these. Isn't that what happened, Mike? Didn't you have the fucking tablets? Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, know, the thing about all this stuff is whenever people talk about legendary entrepreneurs or performers or people of any sort of athlete, they almost talk about them like, well, you know, they got born with this like extra organ called like legendary in business. Uh, and, and, and so they can do things that regular people can't, right? Yeah. And there may be a little of that, but yeah. Um, I don't know. Right. I don't know about any autopsy that ever found any legendary business thing next to your spleen. Yeah. There's no, there's no like, uh, well, yeah. It, it, well, the, the other, uh, the other thing just to kind of close out on the moon landing thought is um, if you, if you have mission clarity, um, you can attract people to your company in different ways. So like, you know, if you're trying to like, if you're a company that's just trying to get people to do iPhone app installs, that's different from we're a company trying to cure cancer. We're a company trying to change transportation. We're a company trying to create, you know, jobs for military veterans. And, and like, it's that mission clarity and compellingness that causes a team to persist through the insurmountable obstacles and the negative chatter. You know, so like when NASA was focusing on landing on the moon, the Russians were having all these tactical victories with Sputnik and like launching little rockets and putting monkeys in space and doing stuff. And everybody's like, well, you know, the Russians are kicking NASA's butt. But like NASA's like, we don't care about that stuff. We're gonna land on the freaking moon. And so, you know, it's like, it took them longer. But having that mission clarity gave them the, the willpower to persevere through the doubts and the challenges and the tribulations, and then they land on the moon and they, they can drop the mic, right? Yeah, beat that, Russia, right? So, uh, and so that was, uh, to me, the moon landing just captures so many things about what greatness looks like. And, you know, they did it before HP even invented the pocket calculator. I mean, it's just like, I don't even know how they did it. You know, they, they, they like put these people in a tube and blast them off into freaking sp- outer space, like without computers to speak of. And like somehow it lands on the moon. I still don't know how they did that. Actually, maybe the fact that they didn't have computers was an advantage. You know, they never had to reboot iOS and yeah, their it's, it's not like never Tesla froze up and shit. Yeah, or the te- my Tesla the other day, the door just started opening for no reason and I couldn't close it. But, but like <laughs> that can't happen on a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> but like, well, but, but, probably pretty exciting at 75 miles an hour on uh, 101 in awesome. Silicon Valley. <laughs> but, but still, having said that, and, and by the way, I think Elon is like I joke about my Tesla, but 
Elon is the guy right now who I think is meeting that standard better than anybody. But 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 um, the standard of would you, would you say he's the most um, important entrepreneur right now in Silicon Valley? He, I think he's the most important prime mover in business right now. Uh, and so uh, and I but but you know the closing out the moon landing thing, they did it in freaking 1969. You know I just sit yeah. there and think about that and it just blows my mind that they did that. Uh, I've I've never seen anything like it before or since. Right? I just I look back on that and just what it took the courage, the talent, the perseverance, just the willingness to cut through the crap. Just, it, it just, I, I, it never gets old for me. It never gets old. Well, in such an incredibly short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just legendary writ large. (laughs) Do you think Mike that um, having a mind blowing technology like that is a prerequisite for being a thunder lizard, which is a word you describe uh, companies that are doing something hyper exceptional? Well, um, I think that, here's how I look at it. I think that the primary animating forces of life today are Moore's Law, which is, and by that, I don't mean just for microchips. It could be how fast you could sequence a gene. It could be, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a, a curve that's an approximate for exponentially improving technology. So, you know, basically technology is doubling in its power every year at the same price. And then you have Metcalf's law, which is about network effects. And Metcalf's law states that uh, the value of a network is a function of the square of its number of nodes. And so- um, And for those of us who have failed grade 10 math, Mike, uh, can you explain a a little bit more about what that means? How that works, yeah. So, yeah, so if you think about a network, if if a network has one person, it's useless, right? Like I can't call myself, uh, not if I'm sane. Uh, but if, uh, if it, now, so let's use Skype as an example, but it's a good network effect example. Now let's say that I want to make phone calls to my buddy. I say, Hey, Christopher, you're my buddy. So, uh, would you use Skype and we can call each other? Well, now all of a sudden I'm getting value from the network and so are you. Well, now you say, Hey, this is kind of cool. I should get more of my friends to do it. So it's not precisely exponential, but if you think about it, it's, it's really like a factorial relationship. So every new node that gets added to that network benefits from the sum of all the prior people that join the network. And so there's an increasing exponential geometric return to scale with these networks. And so, uh, you know, eventually the, the most valuable networks are those that the entire population